Well, hey, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Bridgeway Church. My name is Joel Arison. I'm the lead pastor here, and we are so excited that you chose to spend part of your weekend, part of your Saturday, part of your quarantine with us here at Bridgeway. Every week we say around here that we are a community where you can belong before you believe. So no matter what your week looked like, no matter what your Saturday night looked like, no matter what your background and spirituality is, uh, we believe that you can belong here and take your next step um, towards Jesus with us here. So we're so pumped that you're here. One way that you can help us in helping you belong and connect here is by filling out a digital connection card. Uh, we have this link, bridgewaycocomo.com backslash connect, where you can give us a little information about yourself and help us uh, learn how to serve you and your family better. We'd love to encourage you to do that uh, this morning. If you're new or you've been sort of uh, around in the chat room a little bit, but you want to take your next step with us, please fill that out so that we can find ways to serve you better. Well, you picked a great morning to be with us because we're kicking off a brand new teaching series leading up to Easter. And we're going to sing some great songs together that are going to lift our hearts and our spirits from where we are to where God's calling us to be. And before we do all that, I'd love to pray with you and pray for you and for our world together. And we believe this about prayer, that prayer, it changes things. I mean, it sometimes changes God's direction in what he's doing, but it also, maybe more importantly, it changes us and it reorients us to the way that God has designed us to live so that we don't just survive, but we thrive in this world. So let me pray for us and ask God to move on our behalf and in our hearts and in our living rooms, our bedrooms, on our tablets, our phones, our computers, wherever we are this morning. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you are the God above it all, that you are the God who is ancient, ancient of days, God. You've never not been. You've seen it all and you're above it all and you work through it all. So God, I pray for my friends that are uh, hurting this morning, my friends that are fearful this morning, my friends that are feeling cooped up this morning. God, would you just uh, loosen the chains on their spirits? Would you just lift their, their hearts and their spirits this morning to see clearly you and what you're doing? And God, would you just lighten the load that is just bearing down on their soul in these next moments? We know that you can do these things because you are the God who always does and always has done these things. So God, in these next moments, as we put these truths on our lips, as we sing these songs, we pray um, that you would be glorified. Your name would be made great in our world, but also in our hearts. God, we love you and we thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, let's sing together. Just one word. You call the storm that surrounds me Just one word The darkness has to retreat Just one touch I feel the presence of heaven Just one touch My eyes are open to see my heart can't help but believe There's nothing that our God can do There's not a mountain that He can move Oh, praise a name that makes a way There's nothing that our God can do Just one word
Jesus, let faith arise. Let all agree, there's no power like the power of Jesus. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Let all agree, there's no power like the power of Jesus. I will believe.
You know, there are certain things that get greater over time. They get better over time. Not just wine, not just cheese, but have you ever thought about haircuts? You guys remember haircuts? Uh, if you're looking at me, you're probably like, yeah, I don't think you have had a haircut in a long time, and I haven't, and you haven't either because of COVID-19. But haircuts are one of those things that get better over time. At first, you come home, and you look in the mirror, and you're like, I don't know if I like that very much. A couple days later, they look a lot better. Haircuts get better over time. I mean, do you guys remember this crazy thing? Do you remember wearing jeans? Do you remember wearing pants, like before the age of sweatpants that we're living in now, all in our homes all day long? I mean, jeans were one of those things that get better over time. A well-worn in pair of jeans, it just feels like your best friend, right? It's another one of those things. Friendships are another one of those things that get greater over time. I mean, 15 years of friendship is 15 years of inside jokes, of great memories. Another thing that's gotten better over time that nobody can dispute is technology. I mean, technology is incredible today. The fact that we can gather together digitally and do church, that's an amazing thing. And technology has got exponentially greater over time. I remember my, the very first video game system I ever got was the original Nintendo Game Boy. And man, it was incredible. And it was even better the second year um, that I had the Game Boy because I got this upgrade device. It was literally an extra screen you put on it that was a magnifying glass that made your screen look like twice as big. And it was incredible. But now I look at the graphics of Game Boys next to like Xbox 360 or, or actually that's not even a thing anymore. The Xbox One, I think is what it's called. Or these gaming uh, systems that we can even play online. I mean, it's an amazing thing the way that technology has advanced so much and it's gotten better over time. And here we are, guys. Uh, we're in week three now of staying at home, of the world kind of shutting down. And let me just say this. Um, I miss you guys a lot. I really miss being able to gather with you. And it feels like it's been a lot longer than three weeks. But um, as I was pre preparing for this message this week, um, in the third week of our quarantine, I, I was sort of hit with this question. You know, like when this thing is all over with, and I'm believing that this thing will uh, pass, what am I going to be like after COVID-19? Am I going to be any different than I was when we entered this quarantine? Am I gonna be different? Am I gonna grow at all? Will my faith look any different? Will there be any lessons that I learned? Will there be some things that I was forced to put down that maybe I need to forever put down in my life? And not only that, but I started asking myself, like, what will my faith look like after this whole thing is over with? Will it be the same? Will it be weaker? Or will it be a greater than type of faith? A faith in God that was bigger than the crisis and the circumstances that were crashing down around me and around us. I was asking, will my faith change? Will it be bigger? Will it be better? Will it be the same? I was really haunted by that question. And in my daily reading, a reading plan that we were doing as a church, we were spending a lot of time in this letter that's found in the New Testament called 2 Corinthians. It's a letter written by this guy named Paul in the New Testament. And there were so many things just popping off of the screen or off of the pages from this letter that were just really energizing me and, and begging me to ask some deeper questions about myself and about my faith. Now, a couple of things you should know about Paul. Paul, at one point, hated Christians. So if you're not a big fan of church people, of Christians, Paul's your guy, right? I mean, at one point, he did everything he could to stop the Jesus movement. Then everything in his life changed when he came face to face with the resurrected Jesus. And he actually devoted his whole life to spreading the message of Jesus, making sure that everywhere in the known world knew about Jesus. And beyond that, they all knew about Jesus. But just because he was following Jesus, his life did not go uh, really smoothly at all. He had tons of trials, tons of dangerous things happen in his life. And later in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he starts to list these things. He was beaten within an inch of his life five times by his own people. He was stoned, people throwing rocks at him. He was beaten with rods. He was robbed multiple times. He was thrown into prison many times. And then just to put like the cherry on top of all of Paul's problems. He was shipwrecked. I mean, how many of you guys can say you've been shipwrecked? Not very many of us. But there's this something. He had all these crises that happened in his life and all these challenges that happened in his life. But I was so taken back by this verse in the first chapter of 2 Corinthians, where he's sort of on the other side of these problems. 
And he said this about uh, his, his boast is the way he says it. This is something that he can say clearly after all of these things that happen in his life. He says this in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verse 12. He says, now this is our boast. Our conscience testifies that we have conducted ourselves in the world and especially in our relationship with you, the church in Corinth. We've conducted ourselves with integrity and godly sincerity. We have done so relying not on worldly wisdom, but on God's grace. He says that they've conducted themselves with integrity and sincerity, and they've relied on God's grace through it all. In other words, Paul says that through all these challenges in my life, my faith has grown. It's greater than it was before. And I trust in Jesus and my faith is deeper and stronger than it ever was before. And I was struck by that this week. And I was such a challenge to me thinking about my own life and my own faith. <laughs> and so this is the question I want to run after today for you personally. After COVID-19, the coronavirus, this pandemic is over with, will your faith be greater or will it be smaller? Or will it just sort of stay the same? What will your faith look like? Now, maybe you're tuning in and you're like, I'm not really a person of faith. And you're just kind of confused about the whole uh, phrasing of faith and better faith and all that. And I completely understand that because for a long time in my life, the whole idea of faith was really confusing to me. I mean, I grew up in church, but if you would have asked me, what does it mean to have faith, I probably would have answered it a couple different ways as I was growing up. First, I would have said, well, to have faith means that you believe the right things about God. Like if there was a theology test given at the gates of heaven, you need to answer the right answers on the divine Scantron test. Does anybody still take Scantrons? I don't know. But on the, the test to get into heaven, you had to answer the right answers. That's what I thought faith was all about. And other times I thought having faith meant that I was a part of the club. I had I was part of the Christian faith. Like this is where I put my trust was in this system of Christianity. That's what I thought faith was. And even though there's elements of that that are around faith, faith is bigger than that. I've actually come to understand that faith is much more of a relational word than those things at all. Actually, the best way for us to understand and define faith in our lives is trust. Faith equals trust. It's a relational word. When we have faith, we are trusting who God is, who he said that we are, and how he is going to make all the wrongs right and the path that he is taking humanity and the cosmos on. Faith is trusting in who God is, who he calls us to be, and who he says that we are, and the path that God says he's going to put the world on. That is what faith is all about. So if faith is about trust, what does it mean when people say, well, I, I have a deep faith. They have a deep faith. They have a deeper faith, a greater faith. What does that actually mean? I mean, sometimes when people look at faith like it's having the right answers to the test or being part of the club, they think that a deeper faith is that they know a lot of the the, the scholastic, the intellectual things about faith. Like they're the Bible answer person. They've got a verse for this, a verse for that. They've read all the right books or they're really good at praying out loud. That's what deeper faith is. But deeper faith is not like that when you understand faith in this relational way that faith equals trust. You know what deeper faith actually looks like? Deeper faith is an unwavering trust no matter what circumstances that you're walking through in your life. A deep faith is like when you are in the deep end of the pool and you can't touch the bottom, but you believe that God is there. You believe that God is holding you and you believe that God is going to get you through. That is what a deeper faith is like. And so for us to get on the other side of this pandemic and have a deeper faith, a greater than kind of faith, uh, we need to go deeper into this relationship, go deeper into our trust. And that's what deep faith looks like. I'm reminded of what deep faith looks like. There was this pastor from Romania who was pastoring a Christian church during uh, Russian communism. And he said this about Christians. I love this. He says, Christians are like nails. The harder you hit them, the deeper they go. Christians, Christ followers are like nails. The harder that you hit them, the harder that life hits them, circumstances hit them, pandemics hit them, the deeper they go. The harder that the world swings at us, the deeper in our trust that we should go in our relationship with Jesus. So what I wanna do this morning, picking up from some wisdom from Paul's letter in 2 Corinthians and in other places, 
I want to challenge you to go deeper in your faith, deeper in your trust, so that you have a greater than kind of faith, greater than any pandemic or any circumstance that life can throw at you. So the first lesson, the first bit of wisdom I think that we need to glean from this morning for us to have a greater than type of faith is that we need to learn to be real with God, to be authentic, to be real with God. I mean, can we just like take our church mask off? We're not in a church, but we're doing church. And sometimes we always act like we have to be Ned Flanders of faith and everything's just hunky dory and everything's amazing, right? Take those masks off. Can we be real? Sometimes God doesn't make sense. Sometimes his actions or his inactions don't make sense with the way that we understand God. Sometimes we ask God to do things and God is silent. Sometimes God does not cooperate with our plans, with our schedule, with our timing. I read a blog this last week from the Harvard Business Review, and they explained this deep emotion that many of us are feeling. And this deep emotion is actually grief. We're feeling grief for things that we're missing out on, things that we had planned that are not happening now. We're feeling grief, this anticipatory grief of things that we are going to miss out on because of this crazy pandemic that we're living through. And we're feeling grief because we're like, God, I thought this is the way it was going to go, and it's just not going that way. And, And culturally, collectively, we're all experiencing this grief because sometimes God, God's actions and his inactions don't make sense. Do you know that there is a long-standing tradition in the Christian faith, in experiences with God, where people admit that out loud and they actually cry out to God in a passionate way to complain, to grieve, to mourn the loss of things in our world? There's a long-standing tradition of this. It's actually called lament. It's called lament. And lament, the definition of lament, is a, uh, it's a passionate expression of grief or sorrow. And there's actually a whole book in the Old Testament, the Jewish scriptures, called Lamentations, written by this prophet named Jeremiah. And it is the most emo book that you could ever read in the Bible. I mean, if you think the Bible is just a bunch of like Hallmark card, like cheesy coffee cup Bible verses about how everything's positive thinking, check out the book of Lamentations. This is somebody who is so sad. Jeremiah, the prophet who wrote this, he had just experienced and witnessed the destruction of Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple, the ransacking of this land that God had given his people, the Jews in the Old Testament. He had witnessed the destruction of it and all of Jeremiah's family and all of the people of God had been exiled from this land. And so Jeremiah, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, starts pinning these laments, these grievances, these mourning uh, poems that are now in the book of Lamentations. And I just want to give you an example of something that uh, Jeremiah said in Lamentations, chapter one, verses four and five. He said, the roads to Zion mourn for no one comes to her appointed festivals. All her gateways are desolate. Her priests groan, her young women grieve, and she is in bitter anguish. Her foes have become her masters. Her enemies are at ease. This is not somebody being polite towards God. This is somebody saying, God, what you allowed to happen is a disaster. And I don't know what to do with it, God, but I'm telling you how I'm actually feeling. And I'm being real with you. Later in the Old Testament, there's this prophet by the name of Habakkuk, which everybody should try to say Habakkuk without spitting on your screen this morning because it is a great name. But the name Habakkuk, actually means to wrestle and embrace. I love that. In his name is what he's known for, wrestling with God, but still embracing God, Habakkuk. He said this after he had seen the destruction of the temple. He said, how long, Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Oh, I cry out to you, violence, but you do not save. That's Habakkuk chapter one, verse two. This is someone being real with God, wrestling with God's actions and inactions. I love that's Habakkuk's calling card is he's being real with God. And not only that, but the book of Psalms is full of laments of people being real with God. Did you know that 70% of the book of Psalms, these ancient prayers and worship songs are laments? They're not happy-go-lucky praise songs like many of us sing in churches, if we can remember back to singing in churches, right? But 70% of the Psalms are these laments. Here's a lament from Psalm 88. He says, my life is full of troubles and I am nearly dead. They think I am on my way to the grave. I am like a man with no strength. 
I have been left as dead like a body lying in a grave whom you, speaking to God, whom you don't remember anymore, cut off from your care. Dang, these people are being real with God. They're not being polite towards God. They're being authentic and lamenting towards God. Now, what's one thing across all three of these examples that's true about these laments? Is they're being very real with God, but you know what they're doing? They're being real with God. They're not being real just mourning or they're not being real just like writing a song or complaining to their spouse or to their kids. They're taking their emotions, their grieving, their lamenting to God. You know what happens in my life and maybe in your life? When we're upset, sometimes the last place that we take that emotion is towards God. Somehow we think that we have to have this mask on and everything needs to be amazing in our life all the time if we're following Jesus and we don't take it to God at all. But these laments are God honoring because they're telling God exactly how they feel. You guys, in this moment where there's so much fear, there's so much anxiety, there's so much of us being cooped up and having cabin fever and being upset about what's going on, I wanna challenge you and encourage you to be real with God, to tell God how you're feeling, the good, bad, and the ugly. And I know there's a trend in modern pop Christianity for us not to live that way, but there's an ancient tradition and an invitation for us to lament and be real towards our God. I love the way that Pastor Craig Rochelle says it. He says that God would rather have you yell at him than walk away from him. Let me say that again. God would rather have you yell at him than walk away from him. That is who God is. So my friends, I, I, I wanna encourage you to throw away your polite prayers. Throw away your polite prayers because God's big enough for whatever you're feeling. Be honest with him. That is what God wants. And that's how you grow a deeper faith, a greater than faith during this pandemic. The next bit of wisdom I want us to lean in on this morning, I want to challenge you to do this, to make remember a rhythm in your life. Make the verb remember a rhythm in your life. You know, we are terrible at remembering things today. And I'm not talking just about a memory. We're just bad at remembering things that really matter in our world today. I mean, right now, because of us being like cooped up at home, I mean, I can't really remember what day it is most of the time. I mean, another reason we're bad at remembering is because we're so inundated with uh, information from our 24-hour news cycle and things move so fast, it's hard to remember anything. But not only that, but we're just not naturally self-reflective people. We move on from thing to thing. We move so fast in our lives that we never slow down and ask ourselves, hey, what just happened? What do I need to remember from my day? We're terrible at remembering things. Now, Paul, if we go back to 2 Corinthians, Paul is on the other side of some of his danger that he's been in, but he knows that there's more trials ahead of him. There's more danger in front of him. He says this, and there's so, so much wisdom in this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, he says, He, God, has delivered us from such deadly peril, and he will deliver us again. On him, we have set our hopes that he will continue to deliver us. Oh, I love this so much because Paul says, again, he said, he has delivered us from deadly peril. In the past, God has shown up and he has saved the day. And then he says, and he will deliver us again. Because of the way that we remember seeing him in our past move, we can trust that he's the same God and he will deliver us again. And we're setting our hopes on him to do the delivering, to do the saving, to do the rescue in our lives. In other words, by remembering what God did, we can more clearly see who he is and trust him today. Let me say that again. By remembering what God did in our past, we can more clearly see who he is and trust him today. Now, I think back on my life, and I'm terrible at doing this remembering thing, but as I was sort of jogging my memory this week, trying to remember what God has done in my life before, it was really a moving experience. I remember coming straight out of college, Megan and I getting married at this really incredible time in the American economy called the Great Recession back in 2008, 2009. And Megan uh, couldn't get the job that she was hoping to get. And so I was the only one working and I was fresh out of Bible college at like an entry level position at a church making not very much money at all. And I just remember thinking, oh man, how are we going to like just live off of my, you know, starting pastor's salary? How are we going to do this? And it was so incredible through that season. And yes, we had to tighten our belts. And yes, we had to make decisions to be conservative. But we never went without. 
even though we were just on my income while Megan went back to school to get another degree for a different career path. It was an amazing thing seeing God lead us through that season. And then for years, I know many of you guys have heard this story before, but uh, Megan and I, we were trying to have kids and we were struggling with infertility. And maybe that's your story as well. I want to let you know that you're not alone in that. Uh, we had this experience for about five years where we wanted to be parents, but it seemed like every door was closing in front of us. And through that season, it was, it was hard. It was frustrating. It was challenging. But, you know, through that process, we grew closer together and we came to know God in a new way. And then God did open up a door for us to become pregnant with our now 13-month-old little cannonball of a human being, Jack Lewis Larison. And sort of seeing him um, rescue us, to deliver us from that and to um, say yes to the desires of our heart, maybe not on our timing, but in his perfect timing. I mean, you remember that and you trust that he is a good, good father to you. So let me turn the question to you. What did God bring you through in your life where you thought there was no way? What did God bring you through when you thought there was no way? And maybe you need to like sit on that and maybe journal about that or write that down or have a conversation with somebody about it later. But I think you need to look back and remember what God has done so that you can trust him deeper in the future. And to do this, I think we need to like establish a rhythm of remembrance in our life. And just a couple steps to starting like a rhythm, like this repeatable um, behavior in our life of rem remembrance. I, I will give you a couple steps here. First idea I have is just to start your day with scripture and not your phone. <laughs> start your day with God's unchanging truth, not the news cycle that's changing all the time. Let that be the first thing that enters into your mind in the morning to remember what's ultimately true about him, about you, about what he's doing in the world. Start your day with scripture, not the phone, not with news. Here's another thing. Write down every day a couple things that you're grateful for. This is such a powerful practice for us to write down and think about, ruminate on the things that we are grateful for in our lives. A house that's still standing, our pets, our, uh, our families, uh, our job maybe, our security, maybe our health right now when it seems like our, everybody's health is in jeopardy. You can thank God for those things. Write down things that you're grateful for to lift your eyes to what's ultimately true and remember what God has already done for you instead of focusing on maybe what might not be. And the last thing, listen to worship music. Listen to the songs that we sing here on Sundays and personalize the lyrics with your life. And maybe put on that song we sang this morning, there's nothing that our God can't do. And think about those things in your life that you're like, yeah, but God, can you? And be real with them and say, God, yeah, you know, you did that in my life back when I was in college. You did that in the second year of our marriage. You did that in our kid's life. You did that in that hospital room when we thought there was no chance. And you personalize that. It's a way that we can remember and make remember an action verb and a rhythm in our lives. But making remembrance a rhythm in our lives. It's a way that we grow a deeper faith, a greater than any circumstance or pandemic kind of faith. And the last uh, thing that I want us to glean from the wisdom of the scriptures from so that we can have a greater than kind of faith this morning is this, that we need to focus not on ourselves, but on serving others. Focus on serving others. Something incredible happens when we focus on serving others. Our trust our faith actually grows, it deepens, it becomes greater than anything. Paul says this again in that same chapter in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. He says this, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles. And I love this. So that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. He says that praise to this God who comforts us in all of our troubles. Why? So that we can comfort those in trouble. I love this, that our God is the God of so that. There's always a purpose behind anything that he does in our lives, through our lives. He's the God of so that. He, what Paul is saying here is instead of just focusing on the incredible things that God does for you, Actually turn that around and have that so that reality happen. Blessed to be a blessing. Comforted to be a comfort reality happen for other people. And when we focus on other people, we focus away from my needs, my fears, on me, me, me. And we focus on others. Our faith grows. Uh, there's so many beautiful examples of this throughout church history. One example I remember reading about in college was in the 4th century. 
of the early church. And there was this uh, church historian by the name of Eusebius. And he records, I love this, I'm just going to read this. He records that during this pandemic that was sweeping across the known world where people were dying. And think about this was a pandemic before there was modern medicine and not a lot of understanding about what was happening at all. This was happening. And Eusebius, he records this and how the church and early Christians responded. He says this, that all day long, Christians tended to the dying and to the burial Countless numbers with no one to take care for them. Others gathered together from all parts of the cities as a multitude of those withered from famine and distributed bread to them all. As a result, this is beautiful. As a result, Eusebius concludes, the Christians' deeds were on everyone's lips. Everybody was talking about what these Jesus followers did. And then this, and everybody glorified the God of the Christians. Because these early Christ followers didn't just focus on themselves, but they looked towards the needs of other people. People that were skeptical about what Christians believed. They were blown away and they did a double take at the way that Christians cared for people. My friends, I believe this is what God is calling us to do as the church today. I mean, can you imagine If our world around us, they were skeptical about what we believe, they couldn't get their heads around the resurrection of Jesus or the forgiveness of sins, but they were blown away by the way we treated each other and we treated the most vulnerable around us. Oh, that is incredible. I think that's an invitation that God is giving us to live out today. And if you're a part of our church and you're part of giving towards uh, Bridgeway Church, I mean, you've been a part of this the last couple of weeks. I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, we started this thing called the 127 Care Network, where we're trying to connect people that need help and those who want to help. And then we raised some funds through it the last couple of weeks. And you guys were so generous in this way. And we got to serve people in our community this last week. We actually got to bring a great pizza lunch for um, people that are working on the front lines in healthcare at both of our local hospitals. And they were blown away by our kindness. They just really couldn't believe it when we were delivering the food to them. Not only that, but our friends at bon- uh, Bonavista programs, they really had to shift all of their programming to make it smaller groups and had to retool all of their programs and they were needing some supplies and I contacted a friend that works there and said, hey, at Bridgeway, we want to take care of all of it. And so we bought about $3,000 of supplies and had them all delivered right to Bonavista and they were so grateful that they can continue programs um, for this, this community that needs it so much in our town. It was an awesome thing. Not only that, but uh, we had a lot of really great coffee from our friends at Peshua uh, Roasters that we could not use because we're not gathering on Sundays. And uh, Shelly Rust, who helps lead our hospitality team, uh, she had this great idea of, hey, what if I grind it up and I take it over to CAM, which is a shelter for homeless in our community? And so she did that and we were able to bless them in that way. I mean, I love this picture of us knowing that we're being comforted by our God and we want to uh, be a blessing to others. We want to bring comfort to others in our community. And I know we want to do this, but being in a pandemic, it kind of gets tricky on how do we focus on serving others when you can't touch others, when there's this thing called social distancing going on. And I was just reading a bunch online this week and found some great action steps I think many of us can take that we can focus on serving others and we can see our faith get greater through this. And just some ideas I wrote down for us. You could organize errands for the elderly in your community, in your neighborhood. You can organize errands. You can ask them, hey, do you have a shopping list? I can go pick it up. Or maybe they're having a hard time understanding Instacart or uh, Kroger Clicklist and you could help them set that up and you can help them run errands without touching them, but you can help them during this time because they are quarantined. Maybe that's one thing that you can do to focus on serving others. Another thing is that you can serve healthcare workers. Think of our healthcare workers today are like the first responders at 9-11. Pray for them. Here's a great idea. Not just pray for them, but offer child care for them. Offer to cook them meals once or twice a week. I think this is a beautiful thing that we can do for our healthcare workers that are on the front lines every single day, face to face with this pandemic. I know there's other groups that are helping um, make masks for people, cutting and sewing masks for people working in hospitals. That's another incredible thing, but we can do something for them. Let's serve our healthcare workers. Here's an idea I thought was so great. Um, we can focus on serving others by spending money as an act of economic love. I love that idea of an act of economic love. 
Think about some local businesses and small businesses, or maybe your favorite coffee shop, your favorite restaurant. They're closed down or their traffic is like a fraction of what it used to be. Maybe for you, maybe the most loving thing you can do this week is order carry out from your favorite local restaurant. Or maybe you adopt one of your favorite local restaurants or coffee shops and you give them some money every single day. Here's a creative idea. You can actually buy uh, gift cards online right now so they get some revenue in their pocket and you can spend the money later. Maybe spend more money in and maybe adopt a place or a business or a restaurant to think, hey, I'm just going to funnel some of my resources towards them if you have some margin in your budget to do it. But it's an act of, act of economic love for us to help our businesses and our small businesses in our community. It's a way that we focus on others. And here's something, the last thing I think we can all do. It doesn't take any money. It just takes some love and some attention. I want to challenge you to call, text, check on the most vulnerable people around you. Maybe it's your parents. Maybe it's your grandparents. Maybe it's an elderly neighbor. Call, check on them, text them. I mean, this is such a powerful thing. Can you imagine some of the loneliness that they're feeling? Quarantined, all alone. Bless them with some attention and some of your presence, encouragement. Just check on them. Pick two people this week and do that. It's one way that you can focus on others. And you know what the incredible thing that'll happen in your life and in your faith when you focus on others and serving others? Your faith will deepen. Your trust in God will deepen. My friends, I believe that God wants to use this extraordinary, weird time that we're living in to deepen your faith, to give you a greater than faith, greater than any circumstance, greater than a pandemic, greater than anything faith. And to do that, we've, we've got to take some steps that we talked about this morning. To be real with God, lament, yell at God, be honest with him, be real with him. We need to make remember an action verb, remember a rhythm in our life to look back on how God has delivered us in the past and remember that and to trust him in the future. And we need to focus on serving others. Take the glasses off of us and put it on other people. This is how we have a greater than type of faith during this pandemic. So let me ask you a question as we close. Will you let this quarantine make you bitter? Or will you let this quarantine make you better? Will you look back on this cultural moment, this incredibly historic moment in our world's history and have great stories to tell or just stories of boredom or some funny memes? Let's make this time in history a story worth telling because we grew in our faith, we cared for others, and we made Jesus famous. Let's make this time a story worth telling. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you that you are a God who's worth our faith, our trust. You never fail us. You never let us down. And God, you use these crazy circumstances to bring us closer to you and to bring healing to this world that you love so much. So God, I pray for my friends this morning that they'd be able to take some steps towards you to have a greater than kind of faith, a greater than any circumstance kind of faith. And we thank you that you invite us into this relationship with you. So Father, we love you and we thank you. In your name we pray, amen. Awesome. Well, hey guys, just some closing announcements before you get out of here. Um, just a reminder that we're all in this together and as a church uh, family, we want to come alongside of you and help you through it. And so to build some community, to build some connection and care, we've got some awesome stuff going on. This last week, we actually had our very first table groups, our version of small groups. They met online on Tuesday and Thursday at 7.30. We want to invite you to log into that this next week. Try it out. We had people of all generations checking it out. The technology is not that big of a barrier. So we'd love for you to come connect and take a step towards Jesus and a step towards connection together this Tuesday and Thursday at our online table groups. I also want to remind you, last week I opened up an account at Calendly.com. And this was uh, just a way that I could make myself available to talk to you, to pray for you, to just bring some counsel to you. I've got a couple hours in five 
work days opened up where you can schedule a meeting with me. So that's Calendly.com backslash Bridgeway Joel. I'd love to make myself available to you. And then also, um, I would encourage you guys to join our Facebook group, the Bridgeway uh, Church Community Group. I think it's been awesome as we pray for each other, as we share encouraging uh, thoughts with each other. And as we uh, study scriptures together throughout the week, I post two or three times a day and a lot of people are posting. It's an awesome thing. It's a way that we can stay connected during this time. Okay. A couple of next steps I want to make sure you're aware of. Um, if you are a family and you guys have some Bridgeway kids, whether that be toddlers and preschoolers or elementary kids, we have a streamable uh, worship experience for your whole family that we're linking to in the chat box below. And it'll be in the description. And we want you guys, as soon as this uh, closes out. You guys jump over there and have church with your family and learn the incredible things that your preschool kids are learning, your toddlers are learning, and your elementary kids are learning. So you can hop over there. We're glad that we can have church for your kids and for the whole family this morning as well. And then the last thing I want to let you know, um, ministry is still happening at Bridgeway. So we want to give everybody an opportunity to participate financially uh, in what God's doing through our church. And there are three ways that you can give. You can give through text. Uh, you can give online at our website or you can mail a physical check. I'll check it a couple times a week at 1931 South Elizabeth Street. Um, so we'll have instructions on how to do that below. You can text, you can give online, or you can mail a check to 1931 South Elizabeth Street. Well, thank you guys so much for hanging out with us. I uh, hope this was a blessing to you guys. We are all in this together. Uh, I love doing church with you. You guys are my family. So thanks so much for tuning in. And let's have a greater than kind of faith this next week. Blessings. See ya.